It's time for the College of Bass with Kevin Van Dam and Steve Panaz. Hey everybody, welcome to College to Bass. Uh, KBD will be here in just a moment. Hey, our goal for this series is pretty simple. It's to help you catch more fish. And to do that, we're gonna bring in some of the top talent, bass fishing talent in the entire world. That includes tonight our guests, Berkeley Pro Skeet Reese and Plano Pro Brent Chapman. So stick around. It also includes Kevin Van Dam, whose resume, his fishing resume is absolutely insane. 28 tournament wins four Bassmaster Classic titles and $6.8 million in tournament winnings over the years. So it's it's very exciting uh, to have him on board. Hey, let's bring Kevin on board uh, right now, man. Kevin, how you doing? Doing great, Steve. Uh, man, I'm so excited to, to kick this off. You know, you guys started with the College of Ice and we're, you know, it's that time of year. So we're right into the College of Bass. That's, that's awesome. Hey, it uh, looks like you're at a tournament right now. Yeah, you know, I'm um, uh, down in South Carolina. I'm at a Major League Cup this week. So luckily, these guys were nice enough to let me use their equipment and set so uh, so I could actually kick it off this week. So uh, thanks to the, the staff here at uh, Major League Fishing. So we're going to have a lot of fun, though. I mean, I'm, I'm so looking forward to this. Uh, the one thing that I love to do is, is help people catch more fish. And that's what this series is going to be all about. I mean, we are going to uh, dive deep into a lot of the favorite topics. This week, we're going to talk about pre-spawn bass fishing, but but every week we want to do that. We want to make it interactive. We want to, you know, have people ask questions. We're going to have a lot of great giveaways. We got we got a lot of great stuff going on, but it's it's going to be all about learning to catch more fish. I love seeing all the uh, comments coming in already. It's pretty awesome. Hey, uh, you did mention a prize pack. We are giving away a prize pack every episode. Uh, it's a Plano prize pack worth almost 300 bucks. And uh, Kevin, so how do people win this prize pack tonight? Well, it's it's really just about the the you know putting in the questions. You gotta um, uh, you want us to you know to follow us and to to like the page. Um, you know, we're gonna all of these you can watch on YouTube after the fact as well. And it is it's a great Strike King lure kit, uh, a lot of edge tackle boxes, a KVD bag, and a and a cool College of Bass Yeti Rambler. So it's gonna be fun. That's cool. So like or ask questions or comments and uh, yep. Kevin, Kevin we'll will be winner, announcing. Uh, we'll pick a winner at the end of the show. That's a, that's that's really cool. Hey, it's February 3rd, uh, which means bass just about everywhere are pre-spawn. And I really wanted to talk to you about your thought process when you're targeting pre-spawn bass. I don't care if you're north or south, really kind of take us through how do you locate these fish? Well, the biggest thing during the pre-spawn and, and it really, you know, it's a little bit water temperature, but any time before the fish are actually spawning, you know, from, from that transition from the winter period to the actual spawn, that's kind of what I class it as this. So you kind of watch the weather, but what I'm looking for is those areas that fish are going to migrate in and out of the spawning flats or into spawning bays or shallow areas where they're going to eventually spawn and try to find those holding points or stopping points, you know, a channel swing or a, a point, uh, adjacent to a flat or in weedy lakes it you know it, it may be uh, an outside edge adjacent to a, a, a huge weed flat anything that's close you know you want to think about where they want to head to where they're coming from and how they're going to have to get there and and then use you know the most efficient technique and lure to you know probe and search that area and so part of it is is searching uh, and then once you find them, you know, they're obviously you got a lot of different ways. So it's we're going to talk about techniques and that. But without a doubt, the most important thing always in bass fishing is is, is finding the bass. And you've got to find them. You got to know what stage they're in. Following the seasonal patterns is rule number one in, in bass fishing. It's something that uh, you got to be like a robot. You don't want to have a favorite bait or thing, technique, things like that. You really want to look at the conditions and and basically uh, uh, pick the best thing based on those conditions. So when you talk migration routes, and you've talked about these for years, uh, do you see a difference in reservoirs versus natural lakes? And how do you define or how do you find a migration route? Yeah, it, it is. I think in reservoirs, it's much easier because, you know, the lakes, um, 
you know, have defined a lot of most reservoirs have, you know, fairly defined creek channels or even in some of the places like lowland reservoirs in Texas and that they have ditches and drains and they're going to use those to go in and out from the main lake or from where they wintered at. So it's easier to see that our mapping is so much better these days. You know, I mean, yeah. um, you know, I use the Humminbird Lake Master mapping and it is it is just critical uh, and, and really gives you a great overview of an area. But the biggest thing is looking at the habitat types, you know, the type of body of water um, and, you know, in natural lakes, it's a lot trickier. You know, I mean, structure is much subtler. Flats are in a lot of cases smaller, um, you know, or Florida lakes is another place where it can be challenging because uh, that transition from the season can be just between cold fronts. You know, I mean, one week they're spawning and the next week they're they're back in pre-spawn mode and, and the whole lake might be covered in grass. So it is it's a little more challenging in most places. I, I personally think that reservoirs are the easiest because they're so defined and the, and the mapping is so much better. I was in Florida last month and they were fish on beds as early as the week, first week of January already, which sort of surprised me given it wasn't even a full moon on, on things going on. But are there core areas that you target that maybe load up with more fish than others or maybe you know, have bigger fish on average? Well, you know, typically the larger the spawning area, the more fish it can support. And especially with habitat, you know, if it's got grass or a lot of flooded bushes or, you know, cover like that, that it can uh, support more fish, that's obviously going to be a, a good area. So I like to shade my mapping, um, you know, in five and 10 foot increments. Mm -hmm. And it really helps me a lot during the spawn or to, even if I'm not targeting spawning fish to see where the majority of the flats are, even at a place like Table Rock Lake, which is a, you know, more of a highland reservoir and doesn't yeah. have these massive flats and things like that, that depth shading uh, on my map really makes a difference to be able to see, hey, well, it, it's a good bit flatter in this section or on this side of the lake or on this side of this creek or the bay. Uh, and that, that could potentially be a, a better spawning area. The other big thing is looking at the direction. You know, I mean, uh, you know, northerly banks get the most direct sunlight. They're going to warm up first. So if you can find a spawning flat that's on a northern, you know, the north shore, the north facing creek, um, those are going to be some of the ones that they move to first and and then anything along the way. So structure to me is not the grass, the wood, the rocks. Structure is a contour change or a depth change, a creek channel edge, things like that. And bass always, they don't always relate to cover, but they always use structure. They always relate to structure. And that's how they're going to find their ways in and out uh, you know, of these flats and into these spawning areas. So those are the big things that I'm looking for. Obviously, there's a lot of other tools we can use. Um, one of the big ones now is now that you have a smartphone and you can you get on Google Earth, you can see places, you know, in Florida, you, yeah. you might be able to see a backwater pond at Lake Okeechobee or someplace like that, that or, you know, down in the Delta areas down in Louisiana and that where you can see where there's a, a protected place that might warm up a little quicker yeah. and you might even see the little channels how they can go in and out of those areas you know you talk about map shading i found a spot using map shading uh two years ago and i think it's produced maybe 200 bass for me over the last yeah. couple of summers and it was a spot i would have never noticed uh, without it hey let's talk a little bit about lure choices for pre-spawn i know you're a huge fan of jerk baits can you kind of take us through your jerk your jerk bait program and just kind of go into detail on it yeah, I've seen some questions with that. So um, really choosing the lure is all about the the depth you're trying to cover, uh, the cover that's there. And then really with a jerkbait, it's water clarity. So it is a clear water technique. Um, you know, if I've got a few feet of visibility, it'll work as long as there's bass in that depth zone that the jerkbait's going to run. But I prefer even clearer. So, you know, a, a Jerkbait is a legendary pre-spawn bait and, you know, a place like, again, like a Table Rock or a Bull Shoals or Dale Hollow, uh, it's just unbelievable for that. The clearer the water, uh, it's phenomenal. But it's the same in the Great Lakes, you know. I mean, when we have real clear water, the, the you know, those bass will come a long, long ways to to bite that action. It's that, that start and stop, that wounded bait fish, it just triggers their instincts and uh, it's just a, an awesome tool this time of year. Now, for me, it's a year-round lure, but especially yeah. in the pre-spawn, I have caught some giant bass uh, with it. They just can't help it. So if somebody is really looking for you know, tips on fishing, how do you select the bait? How do you select it? I mean, in terms of the build, the length, the action, 
yeah. maybe the uh, the color. Uh, kind of take us through your thought processes on that. Well, you know, I've developed a whole series of of KBD Strike King jerk baits, and we've got them kind of designed based for the different scenarios. You know, for different depths. Typically for pre-spawn, I like bigger baits. Um, you know, the the 300 series and the 300 deep are going to really cover me from anywhere from you know five to uh, you know 15 feet. The the deep diver actually will run 10 plus feet deep on a retrieve, so wow. it allows you to fish some of these deeper areas or off of some deeper points and things like that. And again, if they can see it, they'll come and get it. You know, I've I've seen. Uh, in our crystal clear water up north where you got 20, 30 foot of visibility that I can pull them out of 30 foot of water to bite a bait that's 10 feet down. You know, you just got to understand that the colder the water, the longer that you got to leave it sit there and, the, you know, the longer it's got to stay in the strike zone to get them to come for it. I mean, that is something that, uh, you know, in those Missouri lakes and that, that it's just legendary. You guys are known for jerking a jerk bait up off of bluff point and letting it sit for 30 seconds and, and having a bass come and take it away from you. Well, can, I don't have that. Do that? Kind of patience, can you do that? You have that kind of patience? No, I do not have that kind of patience. <laughs> no, a, I can't a two either. or three second pause is a long pause for me um, with a jerk bait. But, you know, again, based on the conditions, you, you really have to, you kind of think about that. And if you're going to fish it that slow, you want to fish it near a target, you know, by a stand in timber or a bluff point or a, a boat dock, a deep boat dock or a bridge piling or something like that. And if I know it's in the strike zone, I have a lot more patience. But if I'm just trying to cover a flat or a scattered weed line or something like that, I just, I can't, I can't let it sit that long. But I, I you know, the big thing is I want to pick a bait um, that's going to run over the bass's line of sight. You don't want it to run too deep. You want them to, to be looking up at it. Up. So, you know, if I'm fishing seven, eight foot of water, that 300 series is perfect. And I'll just adjust my line size um, to, to help that running depth. You know, I mean, light line obviously makes them run real deep, but there's certain scenarios, like especially in Florida and that where you're fishing shallower lakes that I may use heavy line to make the bait just run shallower to keep it above that fish's line of sight. That's a key with a jerk bait. So are you throwing floral mono braid? What are you throwing on your, on your, I throw straight floral, but again, the size varies, you know, I mean, if you want it to get super deep uh, you know, I'll, I'll go to 10 or 12 pound test. I, I use 10 and 12 a lot. Um, I don't really like to go less than that. I really want that bait to jump when I snap it and floral has less stretch than say mono does. Yep. And, um, and it's just, you want it to be invisible too. And that they just can't see the floral and in braid has drag. I know some guys like that, but I, my system is designed around the rod action, the, the, you know, the, the uh, less stretch that the fluorocarbon has. And, you know, those baits being able to make a really long cast and still getting that good action out of them. But again, a lot of times I'm fishing it on 14 or 17 pound fluorocarbon or even 20 uh, in places in Florida, just to keep that bait riding above uh, the grass or above the fish's line of sight. And if, plus, if you've got big fish potential there, it'd be yeah, awesome. absolutely. So, yep. uh, on cadence, do you do you work the bait differently when you're fishing smallmouth versus largemouth? Yeah, you know, smallmouth, it's it's definitely they like a more aggressive retrieve, even in the pre-spawn when it's when it's cold. Uh, it's amazing to me how much more aggressive uh, and active bass are in really cold water than. I used to believe, um, you know, I thought that water temperature was the most critical factor, but it, it really is not. So I work it faster than probably most people would, even in, you know, even in early pre-spawn when the water temperatures, even in the mid forties, you know, I mean, I'm not doing those long pauses and, and that, but uh, the cadence is just erratic for me. I'd never have a set. It's not like it's a jerk, jerk pause. I just try to mix it up, you know, snap it a couple of times, uh, then three, then two, then one. The most important thing with a jerk bait is always start and finish with slack in your line. You want to pop that rod and point it right back at it. You start with slack and finish with slack. And that makes that bait really have that great side to side action. And then from there, I'll experiment with longer jerks or shorter twitches. And just when I get a bite, I want to just duplicate that. Most important thing you can do as a bass fisherman is just pay really close attention to everything that's happening when you do get a bite and then duplicate it. Each time you get one, you'll get a, a few more clues onto what they want and how they're eating it. And if they're not yeah. eating it the way, you know, totally great, then you know, I'm going to probably change something a little bit at least. That slack line uh, idea, I always like to hear that hiss. Yeah. You want to, you want to hear that line popping on the surface, pow, you know, I mean, I, yeah. I, I like to, 
yeah, especially for smallmouth, I'm really, really snapping it hard, even in the pre-spawn. Uh, hey, Brent Chapman will be on in just a second. I got one other question. In terms of rod length and rod action, when you're throwing jerk baits, typically, what do you, what do your, what is your program in terms of that? I, you know, I'm a little taller, so I like a little bit longer rod. Um, yeah. I actually designed two in my new lose KVD series just for jerk baits. I've got a 6'8 and a 6'10. It's uh, both are medium heavy action. You want a rod that's stiff enough to make that bait jump at a, you know, on a really long cast, you know, 40 yards out. Um, the gear ratio I throw is a seven, five to one, but it's really not important because I'm never moving that bait with the reel. I'm always working it with slack. I'm just using the reel to pick up a little bit of slack line. I prefer a seven, five to one. Some guys like a high speed, so you barely have to turn the handle. So you match the rod with that fluorocarbon and, and when that retrieve, and it really makes that bait work and really be erratic, even again, way out there on a really long cast. That's what I want it to do is I, I want it to respond. Even if, you know, again, that KVD uh, 300 series deep dive and jerk bait casts like a rocket. I can throw it out there, you know, 50 yards if on a windy day. And I want that bait to respond even with that much distance between it. Uh, you know, and you're going to have to absorb a little of the stretch in that line. Yeah. Hey, we got to bring in Garmin Pro, uh, Brent Chapman. Uh, Brent's been an angler of the year on the Bassmaster Trail in the past. He's had uh, four tournament wins and 41 top 10 finishes. And Kevin, you probably appreciate him more than anybody because you're competing against him every week. He's a, he's a great, uh, great angler, isn't he? Yeah. So, you know, with this first event and we were down here, I knew that uh, Brent's one of my teammates at Plano and uh, he's a very good fisherman, very versatile. You know, he, he uh, grew up in Kansas. He grew up and fished a lot of those lakes in that central part of the country is where he cut his teeth. Now, obviously, he's fished all over the country, fishing on tour for so many years. But uh, he's a real good fisherman. He's a power fisherman like me. You know, he really likes to do that. You don't see him with a spinning rod in his hand very often. And, uh, you know, he's going to tell you the same thing as we love the pre-spawn because it's the time of the year where you're going to catch those really big fish and you can find a group of them. Uh, and we all have our favorite techniques and uh, and he definitely has his. Well, the last time I fished with him, he whooped me with a fairy wand on crappie. So <laughs> he's capable of it as well. Hey, let's bring Brent Chapman on. Hi, guys. Brent, how hey, Brent. you doing, man? I'm good. good. Good to see you guys. And uh, it, it's funny, we're talking bass fishing and... Uh, I was watching the weather while we were looking at, and I probably need to be looking at ice fishing here uh, in the Midwest uh, with, with the weather we've got coming. Yeah, it's we've got some be, brutal, brutal weather headed this way. It's going to be hideous. Hey, welcome to College of Bass. Uh, we've been deep into pre-spawn fishing today, and and Kevin's been really sharing his techniques for uh, jerkbait fishing. Kind of take us through your approach in terms of pre-spawn, and you know what is your favorite uh, lure choice, and and how do you fish them? You know, Ke Kevin definitely touched on, on a lot of the bullet points with uh, with pre-spawn and, you know, the places to look for them. And, and uh, you know, a jerk bait is, is a lot of guys' favorites. And, and uh, you know, I, I got to touch on something that I, that I really noticed that, that Kevin touched on. Kevin, we all know Kevin as being a, a fast fisherman, even, even in the early spring like this. And I grew up fishing in the Midwest on the Ozark Lakes and all that. And Kevin touched on how a lot of times we'll let a jerk bait sit for 20, 30, 40. I even caught a bass one time where I was literally watching my watch where you would let it suspend for 60 seconds before they'd bite it sometimes. And it's crazy, but Kevin touched on the smallmouth, how, how they're a lot more active when it's cold. And I've never got to experience the natural lakes like they have up north in Michigan and all that in pre-spawn. Every time we ever fish north, it's, you know, it's, it's late spawn, summertime or fall fishing. But, uh, you know, and that, that show, that's one area that I'd like to try to do sometimes is do that early pre-spawn fishing up on the natural lakes. But, uh, you know, for, for me, just like Kevin touched on is I'm a power fisherman. I love to fish the bait casters. I don't love spinning rods as much. I, I like the, the heavier line stuff. I like to fish fast. And, uh, you know, I love jerk, I love jerk baiting as well. But uh, another one that I love and, and, and a lot of that, I, I give credit to Kevin, you know, you know, what you learned from him over the years. And, and that's a, you know, shallow cranking square bills, you know, the square bills, the last, what, probably 10 years or so have really come on strong. And, uh, you know, th there's not a tournament we go to or even a practice where I don't have a, some form of several different square bills tied on. Yeah, you're, you're spot on there. I mean, you have to, you have to look at the water clarity and that, and that's where, uh, that's where crank, I'm a big crankbait guy for pre-spawn right. too. And, and you just, they're so good because you can pick the crankbait 
to cover whatever depth zone that you think the fish are in or whatever the cover is. And like you say, so often when they first come up, uh, they're in that square bill zone. So, you know, I, we're all fans of it. We all like to use them in that, but what is the, what is one of the main tricks that you like to do um, during this pre-spawn period when you're trying to find bass with it? I mean, it, with boat positioning and that, I know you want to be as efficient as possible. So, and, and they're good in a lot of different types of cover. Yeah, you know, you you definitely touched on that earlier about about mapping, and you know, my garments have great mapping. Uh, you know, I know yours do too. And and the the big thing with with a square bill is is the versatility of it and and the speed that you can fish and cover water. I mean, you can be on a on a more of a flat bank, and you just you know keep the boat out a little bit farther, you know, in the depth range. But you know, that bait's going to cover that depth range from a foot deep out to four or five, six foot deep, depending on, on where you're fishing. But then as you get to those those steeper uh, 45 degree banks and stuff, you just get your boat a little bit closer to the shore. But as long as that bait's typically, you know, contacting the bottom, it's just a great way to go down the bank, just like you do, trolling motor on high, really covering a lot of water. And, uh, you know, I think that's one of the biggest things is, is covering water. And then when you do find a fish or two, you always save a waypoint because typically you can go back to those places and catch some more fish on those square bills or even even the square bills will show them and then you can catch them on other baits as well what are you throwing those on in terms of uh, the line uh, pound test are, are you going floral or what are you throwing them with yeah i you know i'm 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 a fluorocarbon line guy when it comes to square bills uh, I, I i'm a gamma fluorocarbon guy i've been fishing with them for many many years uh if i'm using like the 1.5 series square bills or, or something smaller typically uh, 16 pound gamma fluorocarbon. If I get into the 2.5 series sizes or bigger, they're typically going to be on 20 pound gamma fluorocarbon. And the biggest thing that I've learned the more I do this, and Kevin even touched, you know, using heavier line on jerk baits is especially when we're in tournaments. When you know, when we're when we're in tournaments, now we're fishing for two pound minimums. You want to give yourself every advantage that you possibly can, and uh, I want to use the heaviest line that I can get away with. And with a with a crankbait. I can, I can adjust the, the depth of that bait, but just by how I hold my rod, if I hold my rod up here high, that bait's going to go maybe a foot or two shallower. But if I get that rod tip right down to the water, I can get another foot or two out of it. And he, every once in a while, you'll, you'll see some pros do it. I still do it. Uh, and that's kneel and reel. If you want to get that, let's say a square bill, if you just want to get it down, let's say eight or nine feet, you know, on a particular spot, you can stick your rod tip down in the water and get down there and do the Paul Elias kneel and reel and get that thing even a couple more feet deep. So just, you know, Kevin taught, touched on experimenting with, with the cadence of a jerk bait. It's the same thing with the crankbait. Experiment with, you know, kind of paying attention to the depth and, and where you need to be having that rod position to get more bites. You know, last time we were in a boat together, Brent, we had an interesting conversation in terms of color and you really have simplified your color selection uh, maybe over the years or at least of late. Uh, what are your preferred pre-spawn colors and, and why? Yeah, you, you know, that that's a great bullet point. To me, I always tell people it's way more important the bait that you're throwing than necessarily the color. And it's even more important where you're fishing it. But as I do this, I, I'm 25 plus years now doing this. And what's interesting is I'm packing a bunch of Plano boxes out here in the shop and getting ready to hit the road. And every year I do this, I seem to take less and less stuff. And I think it's because I've gained confidence in certain colors over the years of, you know, in certain places we go in the country. But, but uh, uh, for, for me, when it's, when it's, when it's pre-spawn, that's the, that's the time I really love the crawfish colors. Uh, it, you know, you, you hear red down in Texas, but uh, if you get into that more off colored stained water, that's where your red crawfishes get to be uh, a big deal. But then if you get into, you know, stained water, your brown crawfishes, but then you get into the uh, clearer water, your green crawfishes. And then if it's, you know, super clear, more of your translucent, you know, phantom colors, that type of stuff. So, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, matching the, the colors, but I love the crawfish colors in the spring. I know Kevin, uh, I look back at a classic many years ago down in New, New Orleans and uh, he'd tell you sexy shad, but uh, the shad colors are good. <laughs> and, and even, even a chartreuse. I mean, day in and day out, you know, if you looked at my crankbait box, I have some version of, of shad colors in my boxes and then some version of chartreuse, you know, chartreuse black back, chartreuse blue back. But this is the year, time of the year that I really focus on the crawfish colors as well. Kevin, do you agree? Or, I mean, do you, do you follow the same process? 
Yeah, you want to you want to match the hatch, and a lot of it is understanding the the lake that you're on and what the natural forage is. You know, uh, where I live in Michigan, for instance, the primary forage in, in our natural lakes is bluegills and crawfish, and so those patterns work. and And actually, they're almost like a chameleon in these clear water natural lakes. The crawfish are, so they're going to blend to whatever background that they're in. And the same with the bluegill. So if they're in green milfoil, man, it's hard to beat colors that are those, you know, green, green pumpkins, the the same colors as the bottom. You know, uh, when I won on Grand Lake a couple of years ago with the square bill, I noticed that the, the rocks on the bottom were really, really dark brown. So I've used a dark brown crowdad pattern and it made a difference over standard other colors. And I ended up winning the tournament. So if you don't know what the best color is, especially in clear water lakes and you're fishing something down near the bottom, use something that blends in with that surroundings. Or if the water's dirty, like Brent was saying, you want to use colors that are more visible. The, you know, the red crawfish, the brighter oranges, um, black back chartreuse, things like that for more visibility. But it's hard to go wrong with being natural. I, I had never even thought of that before. That's that's fascinating. Hey, hey, Brent, if do you have any tips for just a straight retrieve? Uh, I mean, the, the retrieve on a on a on a square bill. I mean, you know, stop, pause. This was a question that just came up a couple of times now from uh, some of the listeners. But uh, you know, how do you how do you work the bait itself? You know, uh, you know, Kevin touched on that with jerk baits, and, it, and it's, a lot of it is experimenting and letting the fish tell you. And uh, uh, it's something that day in and day out it, it changes. The, the biggest thing I can tell you with a square bill is. You always want to want to be hit, trying to hit the bottom, hit the cover, bounce it off of that, and it, it's deflecting and, and doing something erratic. So a lot of times, if you're more on a on a bottom that doesn't have a lot of structure, just smaller rocks, that's where you'll see Kevin a lot, and I do it a lot, is where you're popping your rod tip, and and what you're doing is you're making that bait be erratic, and that is very very critical when in a retrieve, and uh, you know something that that. Uh, that I have to remind myself too, and, and, and a tournament that it wasn't a pre-spawn that kind of reminds me was uh, our heavy hitters event down in Florida this, this past year, guys caught fish there and they were actually, they were burning their baits super, super fast. So, you know, I've even seen that in the springtime where if a cold front comes through, the fish kind of shut off guys that, that are catching maybe on a lipless crankbait or even a square bill is that sometimes you know, you think that you have to slow down, but sometimes you actually have to speed up to get those fish to react. So every day is different and you've just got to experiment and uh, kind of see what the fish want, you know, that particular day. But a, a steady retrieve on a, on a square bill, you typically can't go wrong as long as you're bumping it off the cover or bouncing it off the bottom. So what retrieve ratio are you typically using? Uh, I'm, I'm a cast king rods and reel guy. I use uh, their Bassinator Elites and, and they're an eight, four to one. So they're pretty fast, fast real. Fast. Yeah. So I've learned, uh, you know, early in my career, I was all about using slower gear ratio reels, but, uh, my buddy, Aaron Martins, you know, with him and I, uh, spend a lot of time together and, and, uh, he uses high, super high speed reels on everything. And, uh, the more, I think it's just more time on the water, more what you get comfortable with. And, and I've grown comfortable with that higher speed reel. And, uh, I learned a, a valuable lesson about using high speed reels last year. And I, and I hate to, admit to my mistakes, but, uh, I, you know, I think that's <laughs> what people can learn is last year I caught a lot of fish on a bladed jig and I was throwing a bladed jig on a six, four to one, you know, something where I could really work that bait slower and really get a lot of feel out of it. And I actually lost two valuable fish last year at, uh, at the Lake Fork event. One of them, uh, a fish came up behind me. I just caught a five pounder threw the bladed jig back out there and another fish hits it and darn near jerked the rod out of my hand. It slipped out of my hand. I catch back up with it. And that slower gear ratio reel, I could not catch up with the fish. And it literally just kept coming to me. I finally catch up with it and it just spit the bait out. And then in the finals, I, I had it happen again. And at that point I said, I've got to train myself to fish this bait on a higher speed reel. So now, now I throw it on eight, four to one. And it's kind of the same thing with, with the square bills or whatever you're fishing. I think it's important if you can get away with fishing a higher speed reel, I think you're going to have a lot more success. Just like I said, with, with uh, landing fish, or if you're trying to get a bait to act a little more erratic, re getting a bait to react a little more erratically, you can do it with a high speed reel. Well, wow. and in terms of rod actions and length, what are you running for typically when you're running uh, your. I'm, I'm like I said, I'm a cast King uh, rod guy as well. I use uh, uh, their, their pro series. Uh, 
the Speed Demon Pro Series. Uh, they they've got a seven foot lipless cranking rod that I that I love for the for the bigger square bills, the two point fives, that kind of, and then the one point fives I'll throw on what they call their crankbait rod. It's a seven foot, and then uh, they've also got a six eight square bill rod. So if I'm in tighter quarters, you know maybe around docks or laydowns, I'll throw that you know six eight just a little bit shorter rod for the tighter places as well. Well, great information. Kevin, any, any more you want to add or, or with Brent? We all have our, our preferences and I, I'm pretty much the same way. I mean, I've, I like composite rods for, for cranking for sure. Uh, that's one thing that's really helped me. I think the fish eat the bait a little bit better and I've got a whole series, you know, of, of rods that I have learned, you know, that really make a big difference for me with when you, you know, get the bite to be able to land the fish. It's all about the, the right rod combination. But just like Brent said, if you really need to make good, accurate casts and, and it's important if you got tight cover, like boat docks or lay downs and that, that shorter rod is much better for accuracy. And, you know, a longer rod is a lot better for power. So if you're fishing big grass flats, like down there in Florida, you can use a bigger, longer rod, but in tight, you want that shorter rod. That's awesome. Hey, Brent, uh, thanks so much for joining us on College of Ice, man. You've been on the first episode ever. Hey, thanks, absolutely. Brent. I enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, I told you earlier, I, th I think this is going to be the future of uh, how we get to interact with the fans and educate them. And uh, I know this is the first one, but uh, hopefully it won't be the last. And looking forward to doing more. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Hey, thanks again. Perfect. Have a great night. Absolutely. And uh, one last thing, go Chiefs. <laughs> <laughs> you had to do it. <laughs> see you guys bye you, it'll be a good game this weekend for sure uh, coming up super bowl coming up in that but are yeah you, are you rooting you know, for one team or the other Kansas city guy. are you are you uh who are you rooting I, for you know i i have some friends that really like the chiefs so and they're they're a really good team i think they're going to be hard to beat but i'm a tom brady guy i'm i'm not a patriots fan but i'm a longtime tom brady fan he grew up in michigan i got to meet him at the espies back in uh 2001 when i won an espy i got to spend time with him and his family and i've been a fan ever since he is down to earth super good guy and obviously look at his record you know he's 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 the greatest of all time and um so i'm i'm rooting for him you know he's a little That's older like myself we all want to we all want to win again so he's very inspiring uh, that'll be a, it'll be a fun game. Hey, our next guest is uh, one of the top five tournament winner uh, money winners of all time, with more than three point four million dollars. He drives the best truck on the circuit. I think uh, that thing is a is that a seven hundred series or something for it. It's pretty it's, cool. He's got a giant truck. <laughs> he uh, he makes a statement. You know, he's he's black and yellow. I mean, you tell when ski. <laughs> or his truck, um, his rods, everything. You know, he's he's last sound of that a long time ago. He's a longtime friend of mine, a uh, really good fisherman, another power fisherman. You know, you see how we got a lot of power fishermen on when we're talking about pre-spawn bass. And then, um, you know, he's got one of his favorite techniques. Now there's a lot of different ways you can fish during this time of year. And we're covering, you know, just a few of them. We're trying to get a lot of details in. Um, but Skeet is very good with bladed jigs. And, and that's, you know, that's some of the things we're going to, we're dive into that's deep awesome. when we get him out of here. Let's bring in Skeet Reese. What's up, guys? How you doing, hey, Skeet? I know. I'm like, Kevin's on camera with his glasses on. I'm like, uh, I can't see this little screen without it, man. Yeah, I'm just not wearing mine right now. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Skeet, right. we're, we, we've been covered a lot of uh, pre spawn bass, and, and obviously you've had a tremendous amount of experience with it. You've won, you know, the Bassmaster Classic in the past, you've won Angler of the Year in the past. Yeah. But kind of take us through you know, some of your lure choices for pre-spawn and and how do you how do you rig them how do you fish them gosh I, it's Steve, that's a great question um yeah it's i know it sounds simple and but then when you ask me a question my head goes boom because i as we travel around the country we we come across so many different situations around so many different fisheries around the country north south east west and there there is no one set rule that works for the entire country uh but as a whole i start thinking about two types of lakes that we're going to fish um you're going to fish uh, man-made or even natural lakes that uh, are that has a lot of hardscape a lot of hard cover um, and then you get into some lakes that have actually grass in them so if i'm looking for a pre-spawn fish 
Uh, if there's grass present in a lake, a pre, pre-emergent grass that you can find, those fish will definitely be there. Um, if you don't have the grass, then I'm looking for hard cover. Um, rock, I think, is the number one key thing that you want to look for in any type of body of water, um, unless it's got grass. And if you can find a gra- you know, peep gravel and some milfoil hydrilla mixture, then that's going to be great for the grass lake. So the techniques kind of change a little bit depending on where I'm going. Uh, but the two that I look at now, and and I've probably won, I know a lot of people think, oh, I'm a swim bait guy, power fisherman, which, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to do well with that. But I've probably won more money in my career with a flipping stick or casting a jig than I have done anything. And so I look at a pre-spawn bite that a jig is i don't know i don't know if there's anything that's caught more big fish across the country year and you're out in free spawn than a jig um you hear so many of those teens being caught on jigs 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 it's a deadly way of catching them obviously the bladed jig has come on popular the last few years and you know the one thing that i always and this, i i learned this uh, a long time ago and i'm i'm still believing this that in pre-spawn the two things I'm looking for is either, you know, you're trying to imitate is crawfish and bluegill. Um, those are the two things that always seem to be present in wherever we're going to find pre-spawn fish. Um, obviously, you get into herring lakes. Herring lakes are a little bit different where the herring will run back up in the creeks in super shallow water and 40 degree weather and 40 degree water temperature. In fact, bass will be schooling on them. So take herring lakes out of the picture because they don't okay. make sense to me sometimes. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go back to traditionally. And if I'm looking at pre-spawn, um, you know, uh, it's, I would, I love little, anywhere you can get some type of 45 degree break, little drop off rock transitions. Um, you, you know, uh, Kevin and Brent were talking about uh, the Ozark lakes and, um, but that holds true to whether it's Lake Shasta, Northern California, um, Santee Cooper, if you're up in a creek, it could be anywhere where you have those rock transitions, a little bit deeper break. Um, the colder the water is and the more vertical, I believe those fish want to have that rock. Um, I don't know if they just, I don't know if they snuggle up next to it just for warmth or whatever it is. <laughs> um, but I still believe that it's, crawfish and bluegill that i'm trying to imitate to catch more fish consistently throughout the country and and i learned this from a a, one of my fishing game buddies maybe 30 years ago uh he was a biologist back um and he and i'm still i'm 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 holding his word that this is the truth of it that female fish female largemouth and i'm i'm happen to think that spots and smallmouth are the same way tend to want to eat more crawfish in a pre-spawn because the calcium in the crawfish shells helps build the eggs. I guess, the, you know, it helps, I don't know if yeah. it's not fertilized. I mean, obviously it doesn't do that, but the calcium in the crawfish helps ensure the egg makes the egg stronger. I don't, I don't know the exact word for it, but I know that when I learned that, I was like, so that does make sense. I mean, that's why you see and hear about so many big female fish getting caught in pre-spawn on jigs. You know, um, they don't want to chase all the time. So a crawdad, they can just lay there. A crawdad crawls out of the rock. So suck so, it up, Scooby snack. So ski, you're obviously using a, a a craw type trailer on the jig. Which which is your preferred trailer? So my my new favorite trailer. Um, it is hands down it's the berkeley max scent chunk um there's a lot of there's a lot of good trailers out there a lot of action the colder the water is the less action i actually want out of a bait um so the old chunk style and that's where the the max scent chunk it's just kind of a it doesn't do a lot but the scent in itself is something that you know when you when you look at it and you see the science of it you, you watch how it disperses scent in the water there's nothing like it. So when the bite is tough and you got one that's just down there nosing on your jig, looking at it and he's going, yeah, I'll eat that. So, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a firm believer that max N helps in that situation. Uh, my jig color selection is pretty simple. Uh, it's, it's brown, it's black and brown, black and purple and black and blue. And that's pretty much my jig combination. Now, no no green pumpkin. pumpkin. What's that? 
No green pumpkin? No, I'm usually a brown. Black, brown, or black and brown is my go to. Gym Not black and yellow? Come on. No black <laughs> and yellow? <laughs> so, um, and, and the line situation varies on the size of the jig you're trying to fish. If I'm going to fish a little light wire jig and, and make long cast, uh, I'll fish it down on as low as 12 pound test. But if I'm going to throw a flipping style jig, that's got a five odd hook in it and uh, 12 pound test isn't the right line to be able to get a good hook set with a jig like that. So that's where you're going to, you know, I'll step up into 20 pound test. And, and if I'm flipping, I'm going to flip that same jig and pitch in the cover with on 25 pound trialing fuller carbon. That's my, my go-to flipping line. Um, and then 12, 15 and 20 for casting my jigs. Now switching over a little bit and getting back to talking about bladed jigs. Um, if you got pre-emergent grass, you know, the, for years, and Kevin's probably won more money on a lipless crankbait than most of the world. And lipless crankbaits are dynamite, and that's you know that's that's another you know it's another tool in the the queue that we have to have in these situations where you have pre-emergent grass. But the bladed jig in the last ten years has come on, and really the last five six years, like it's taken this the nation by storm, and realize how effective a bladed jig is in pre-emergent grass. You know, we always create that reaction strike throwing a, a lipless crankbait and trying to snap it out of the grass uh, and you know fish that are lethargic you create a reaction strike they're going to grab it well you do the same thing with that bladed jig and allow it actually comes through grass super efficient um, so learning that a, a bladed jig is a great imitation for a bluegill a crappie it can be crawfish it could be uh, it's a dark pattern traditionally uh, that i'm going to fish in a pre-spawn green pumpkin is my number one i'm going to have a green pumpkin with some orange some green pumpkin with some chartreuse uh, i'm going to go uh black and blue and those are like my core colors that i start with i'm going to going to run with now i can mix up the combination with my trailers uh, and i designed a bait for berkeley it's called the deal and it is uh it's it's the deal <laughs> Uh, it's, I designed it that there you go. There's a great picture of it. I designed that bait specifically to be a bladed jig trailer and it's a vertical tail that has a unique swimming action, a more of a natural swimming action than anything else. And, and there's some good trailers out there, but that one I designed strictly for a bladed jig trailer. Are those and the same the, legs as the pit boss just turned similar? Yeah, they're, they're, they're tweaked a little bit, but that's where, uh, I got that from is, you know, the pit boss was such a has been such an amazing successful bait and, and fish catching bait so why, why not take some of the technology from that incorporate it into this and the, the deal there is i mean it works great by itself you, know, you can put on jig head a weedless hook but originally it's for a bladed jig trailer um so but if you want to you're looking if i'm going to go fish a bladed jig and pre-spawn i'm looking for i'm going to be back up in a creek or the inside corners of a flat where there's going to be some pre-emergent bass or pre-emergent grass that the fish are staging into um and i think you know i mean we've all watched kevin catch a monolipus crankbait and and the bladed jig is is kind of one of those new tools to do that so you're going to fish it in anywhere from two foot out to about 10 12 foot of water depending on the lake you're in but Typically, you're going to look in those creeks, backs in the creeks, even though it might water temperature be 45 to 55 degrees, they're still going to bite a bladed jig. You just The biggest thing you want to make sure is you're getting that jig down into the grass and deflecting it off the grass and popping it out, just like you would a lipless crankbait. Hey, so I'm going to fish that typically on a seven foot medium action graphite rod. Um, you know, some guys like glass, whatever, everybody's, I like graphite on a bladed jig because I want to feel, I like that feel and that quiver of the rod tip um and line diameter determined so if i'm going to fish real thick milfoil and i would i actually like to fish a bladed jig on uh braid so 30 pounds uh spider wire berkeley braid and that way you actually can snap it and pop it and clear it out of that grass real efficiently the biggest thing you've got to make sure is that you do have a lighter action rod for that so you don't pop the hook out of a fish or straighten the hook out um so I don't know what I'm going on, uh, but go back hey, to looking hey, at the lighter line to get it down deeper. Yeah. Just like they're talking about with crankbaits and jerkbaits. I've got a question for both. Actually, Kevin, I'd like to ask you this. Has the, has the bladed jig replaced uh, spinnerbaits? <clears throat> Boy, it sure uh, has changed fishing a lot. So one of the big things that I think 
is that now that we have all the tournaments are live streamed and we got a camera in our boat when you're doing well and bladed jigs have become, you know, a, a mainstay lure and people are, can watch and see how they're fishing them or, or whatever technique that it is. The big thing now is we have so many tools for the same job. You know, Skeet was talking about for this crash, you can use a lipless crankbait, you can use a square bill, you can use a bladed jig, you can slow roll a spinner bait. What a bladed jig um, does for me is it just the vibration. It's so, uh, it moves so much water, but you can slow it down enough that you really have great control. I mean, you can fish it through the grass and not get it banked, balled up. Uh, it's a lot easier to fish than a crankbait and it stays in the strike zone a little bit longer. It displaces a lot of water and big fish bite it, you know, and that's, that's why I think it's come on strong, but yeah, uh, ski to tell you the same thing. I'm sure that a spinner bait is still a really, really great lure, um, you know, to fish. It's just that we have all these options now. You can throw swim baits, you know, lipless baits. You can fish a jerk bait. You can fish a square bill, uh, bladed jigs, all in the same scenario. And they're, and they're all good choices. It's just on one day or the next under certain conditions, one will outshine the other. And a, But a bladed jig fits a lot of different scenarios. And, and Steve, I'm going to just jump, say it real quick. So the bladed jig has stolen the thunder of a spinner bait for the last several years. But I did notice this last year that a spinnerbait really did show itself again in a lot of tournaments. And there is a time and place for a spinnerbait. It's it's one of those tools that will will is timeless. It'll be it'll be a fish catching bait forever. And the one thing I would say this is like if you're in shallow brush and those fish are staging up in buck brush or lay down something like that on a yeah. pre spawn situation, that's where a bladed jig does not shine. Um, and you get it around wood, they're pretty snaggy. And that's where a spinner bait would take over um, and is much more efficient to get through wood than a bladed jig. Hey, Kevin, I got a funny, I got a funny story I got to share. Uh, uh, Skeet, uh, over in Wisconsin, I think you remember this. We, we pull up to a, uh, a, a bank angler and he, and he says to Skeet, he says, what do you think of my lure? He had some pink. It was a pink worm. <laughs> it was like this long with with spinners sticking all over it. And he said, to, he said to Skeet, he said, what do you think of my bait? And Skeet says, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. And, and Skeet, what happened after that? He caught a four pounder, right? <laughs> <laughs> Off the shore. Oh, was, I was like, oh crap. I was like, that no, was, I, so it just goes to prove it. Sometimes they just, they will hit anything. So <laughs> it was fun. That's when you know the bite's really good. Yeah. Yeah. So Skeet, uh, where, where do you head to next? Uh, I'm actually going to be uh, Lake Okeechobee for the Major League Fishing Pro Circuit event. And this will be the uh, kickoff event. Excited. Um, hoping to get a, you know some warm weather. I'm wanting some tan line from my flip-flops on my feet. And, uh, and hopefully in the end, catch some big ones down there and have a little fun. That's awesome. Hey, uh, we really appreciate you coming on College of Ice tonight. Thanks so much and uh, good luck this season. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. It's, uh, you know, I'm honored. You know, when Kevin called me and asked me if I'd be part of this, I was honored. So thanks for letting me be part of the, uh, the first and uh, hopefully one of many more to come for you guys. And if I can come back again, um, you know, give me a call, but much appreciated. Good luck to both of you. Hey, Except thanks. Kevin. Ski. I don't and want Kevin to catch him. Yeah. Thank hey, you, Steve. Uh, Steve, you said college of ice again. He's so used to saying college ah, of ice. <laughs> I said <laughs> we don't. It's pre-spawn, but we we don't want uh, we don't want any ice or that. It, it's been cold all week down here in South Carolina, and yeah. uh, it that's a that's a challenging thing. You know, this time of the year, the weather the weather is everything. Watching that weather, the one thing I'll tell you about every professional bass fisherman, they are fanatics about the weather. Uh, we've got all the different apps. I've got them all. I mean, I have a bunch of different weather apps on my phone. I'm looking at my radar. We're we're trying to predict the future. And that's really a lot of what you have to do during this time of the year is, is look at those trends and base your, um, your, your first initial guesses, you know, when you're going out searching for bass based on, on the weather or what the weather is going to be. You know, I'm, I have to practice a lot of times, you know, for that, you know, future uh, tournament or, you know, for that uh, time on the weekend. So you want to look and see what that trend's going to be and start thinking where the fish may be or might move to based on whether it's good weather or bad weather coming. That's Five P's. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully you get some good weather down there at Okeechobee. I hope it's, so. Right, it's man, a great trip. It's night. one of my Thanks favorite. For me. Remember the sunscreen, man. We'll see you later, Skeet. See ya. See you, Kevin, uh, at the Classic a few years back, uh, I don't know if it was South Carolina, North Carolina, it was so cold there. You guys had to float your boats just to get the uh, boats to unfreeze from the trailer. Uh, is that kind of what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, th the biggest thing, um, if you're in a cold area, like, you know, you and I both live in the north, and yeah. the, the cold doesn't affect the northern fish as much because they're more used to it. When cold is really bad is when you're in the deep south. You know, if you're in Texas and you get a major, major front and, and the, it really drops the water temperature, especially in Florida, those shallow lakes down there, um, you get a 32 degree uh, temperatures down at Okeechobee, it's no fun at all. Uh, it really affects affects those fish. Where at a, in Michigan or even in Missouri or Tennessee, uh, it, it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't affect those fish, especially deeper fish. You know, the water temperature doesn't change 10, 15, 20 feet down, but in shallow areas it is. And, and those big strong winds can really move a lot of, you know, colder water into areas and things like that to where it can uh, be a be a real problem and change you know change those fisheries so it's just important to really watch uh, those weather trends. So talk a little bit about the effect uh, specifically pre spawn you've located fish you've got a, a say a, a rising temperature uh, or a fall in temperature uh, how does the, how do the fish react how do you respond to those uh, situations? Well, in a lot of cases, it's a lot of the other factors too. So, you know, you, you really want to pay close attention to the water levels, you know, in reservoirs, um, they can rise real fast. You know, we get a lot of big fronts and, and a lot of rain, a lot of runoff, and they can rise real fast and then they can fall real fast. You know, I mean, uh, seems these days that a lot of the, the companies that manage these lakes just really like to jack with the water, uh, both up and down. And if you get water that's coming up fast and, and especially it's warming, I mean, those fish will, will run to the bank as soon as that cover gets flooded, they're in it, you know, especially right as they're getting ready to spawn or right before they get to spawn. I mean, there can be no water in the bushes and the next day there's, you know, two foot of water in the bushes and the bass are already there. So, and the exact opposite is true. If it starts to fall, I've, I've learned that the hard way in the past that even if the water is real high, um, those fish will leave with the water slightly fallen. Uh, early in my career, I fished a tournament at Sam Rayburn. The lake was 12 feet high. It was so far back into the woods that I had to take my you know boat back in there. And I was catching fish in 52 degree water back in the woods that were staging to spawn. It was in March. And uh, I caught a huge bag. I caught a 31 pound bag the first day of the tournament. Wow. And the next day, the water dropped about four inches. They started to pull it down. And those fish vacated the woods. I mean, they were all gone and there were still tons of water in there and the temperature hadn't changed, but that water fluctuation made a move. So it, there, there's no exact rule every time, but in general, as the water rises and as it warms, they're going to come up. And as it, as it cools and falls, they're going to, they're going to you know, move out. The key is, is looking for those those places along that staging, where's the next stopping point? You know, is there grass? Um, is there an edge, you know, outside of the, the shoreline edge that you're, that you're fishing? They'll move to the first drop or the, the first break or the inside weed line or whatever is the next, uh, you know, piece of structure or cover line available to them. So Kevin, your success rate clearly shows that you, you do something, you you're, you're doing something different than everybody else. Is it being able to kind of figure out those situations like uh, when they vacated the wood yeah you know, what was your response to that well i was i was dumbfounded uh when that <laughs> back then and i i just didn't you know i'd never coming from michigan i was the beginning of my career i didn't know to you know what to do at then and i didn't really make the right choice but over the years now you know the more experience that you have uh the more times you you see similar things and I know, though, that you just don't it, there's no automatics. There's no book to, to follow uh, every single time. You know, I've been doing this for 30 years competitively. I've been competing in tournaments, um, you know, on the at the pro level. And I still learn every single time out. Uh, like I'm amazed at how much I'm still learning and, and how different things are and how technology keeps coming and, and changing. And you have to embrace that and keep an open mind. The best fishermen that I've ever been around the, the most, you know, early in my career, you know, you guys like Danny Brower and, and Larry Nixon and Rick Clun, 
they're super intuitive. They are very aware of their surroundings and they notice those little subtle changes. You know, the, the difference between um, the sun being out and the sun going behind the clouds or, uh, you know, the, the, a slight change in water clarity from one creek to the next, you know, just little things make all the difference in the world. You have to be aware of those. And that's something that's hard to learn. Uh, you just you just have to force yourself to really think, uh, you know, when you get that first bite, everything that was happening, what was your bait doing? Was it falling? Did you stop it? How fast were you reeling? You know, all these little things that can help you uh, get clues to, to catch the next one. That's what pattern fishing is all about is, is putting as many like things together uh, in an area and then trying to duplicate it. So in building patterns, do you, do you find it's more difficult on lakes that you've fished before or new bodies of water where you go in there more, you're fishing it more intuitively saying, well, I'm not stuck. I caught them here last time on this. Kind yep. of take me through that process. It is. It is hard. You know, um, again, I've had a lot of experience. A lot of these lakes we've been to so many times. Um, you take Lake Gunnersville, for instance. It's a place that I've fished time and time and time again. Um, it does change a lot from year to year based on how the grass fluctuates. And now there's, you know, a lot more eel grass and things in there. So that's one big change from year to year. But it's hard to forget that history, you know, to think about, hey, this this area, I caught them in, even if it's the same time of year to to not go back there. It's it's better for me or I seem to do better if I go in totally open minded. I love fishing new bodies of water for the first time because mm -hmm. you just you go with a blank slate and I just follow that same, um, you know, method uh, system that I've used my whole career. You know, I wrote a book about it, you know, following the seasonal patterns and time of the year and what you do under certain conditions and things like that and go in open minded like that. And uh, uh, that that's the best way to do it. Uh, when you do have experience, it's helpful because you know the lay of the lake uh, and, and that's important. Uh, you know, so I always take the experience, but I found a lot of times that, you, you know, thinking about the past has burned me. So, Kevin, we're, believe it or not, we're almost done. We're almost <laughs> running out of time. Well, I, I'm hour. sitting here going, we, I, I want to go another hour or two, but uh, we've got, we've got, uh, we're going to have every Wednesday night, eight o'clock Eastern, we're going to, we're going to have uh, coming on. What are some of the topics that, uh, that you, that we're going to cover in the next couple of weeks, next well, several weeks? Yeah. So we're going to try to, to cover a lot of different things, you know, and you can, you know, all the fans that are watching, you can send in some of your questions, some of the things you'd like us to talk about. I want it to be timely. So right now we're, you know, we started off because it is kind of the pre-spawn season for most of the year. Um, our, our guest next week is going to be Ot uh, Defoe. And Ot is one of those guys that's really good at finding hidden spots. You know, uh, he's known for using a jet boat and going up in creeks, but he's also really good with his Nitro Z21 about finding places, even on your home lake that are overlooked by other people and that. And that's, so we're going to talk a lot about some of that thing, some of our little tricks. You know, everybody is looking for an edge. You know, they're looking for that secret. They're looking for something that can can make a difference. And that's what we want to try to do with this show is to help people be more successful when they're out there on the water. And we're going to cover a lot of different things. We're, we'll talk electronics. We'll talk, uh, you know, techniques. We're going to talk equipment. We're going to talk patterns. We're going to we're going to mix it up. We're going to have different guests each week to, to try to really do that. But we want the fans to be involved in, and we want it to be uh, we want it to be helpful. So, so uh, Kevin, next week, the bass. we want to yeah. teach. Yeah. So next week, what I would like to do is a lot of the questions that were asked this week, we'll, we'll bring them into the show and, and, and give you a chance to answer yeah. those. And and maybe I have Ott uh, involved in, in that as well. Hey, uh, Kai, we're going to need to pick a winner tonight. So uh, give us some uh, some options there on that and uh, we'll go forward with that. Um, yeah. Kevin, um, one other question uh, that came up that I just I just saw. Is uh, is there a is there a, a color that you tend to go to other than sexy shad? But is there a, a color that you that if someone was limited to one or two colors fishing, say northern waters or southern waters, what would they, what would your number one uh, choice be? 
Man, it'd be it's it's tough because I'm not limited to to just one. You want to match the hats, yeah. you know. But um, a bluegill pattern is one of my favorites. I mean, I have learned growing up in Michigan that bass love bluegills, and just about any time of the year, they're they're always targeting them. Now you go to certain places where if shad are the predominant forage, then you got to use shad colored baits, and if it's dirty water, you got to have something visible. But uh, a bluegill pattern is something that that I have tied on. And a you know a bladed jig, a jig, a, a spinner bait, a crank bait, a, a you know just about everything, lipless baits. So bluegills are a big big deal. Awesome. So uh, Kevin, I'd like you to announce the the winner for tonight. Kai is going to pop the name up here in just a second. So we've got our our winner for the first ever College of Bass. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we're going to do this. We'll do it every week. We've got these these giveaways, uh, and so it's going to be a lot of fun. So. I'm waiting yeah. for him to. I am waiting. I think he's uh, he's working feverishly. There we go. Ah, uh, there we go. Adam, Carl, Kier. I'm not sure exactly how that is, but anyways, you're the winner uh, tonight. You're going to win uh, that Plano tackle pack. We got a bunch of great edge boxes. You'll love it. Uh, you know the edge boxes are just incredible. It's made me a lot more organized. I love the visibility yeah. of them. I love how they keep the base. And one for sure, you got to check out. You know, Skeet, we talked about jigs, and that is the. The Edge Jig Box is a game changer for me. It's it's one of my favorites in the series. Um, I've got them for bladed jigs, swim jigs, football jigs, flipping jigs. It's a box you got to have in your arsenal. It's amazing. Kevin, uh, wonderful night. I, I really appreciate the chance to sit down with you tonight. And uh, to everybody, join us next week, uh, 8 o'clock Eastern, right here at the, on Facebook. And uh, we'll have questions uh, yep. that we can share with Kevin. So, yep. And everybody knows too that you know if you've missed part of the show, you want to watch it. Um, you can uh, you can see it on our YouTube. It's be on my YouTube channel. It'll be you know you'll be able to find it on Plano's uh, YouTube and uh, Lake Plano's as, as well. So it's just yep. about everywhere. So we're gonna have it's fast paced. We're gonna have a lot of fun, and uh, I promise it'll it'll get better each week. We're we're learning. Awesome. Good night, Kevin. Have a great night. You bet. Thanks, guys. Good night, everybody. Thanks for watching the College of Bass. Join us for an all-new episode every Wednesday night.